Hello, my name is Orville McInnes. I'm the program manager of the West Side San Joaquin River Valley Watershed Coalition. I uh, want to thank you for being here today. Uh, this is the video for the 2020 Focused Outreach Meeting. Uh, and it's why you're here today uh, to listen to what we've got to say and see what we've got prepared for you. Hope you enjoy it. Have a great time watching this. We'd like to begin this morning with uh, the thought of uh, what the Watershed Coalition is, what we do, uh, where it's at. Uh, we encompass about 460,000 acres. We monitor several uh, tributaries to the San Joaquin River, three water source sites, as well as two wetland channel supplies. Uh, though we, um, our boundary goes way up into the uh, Sierra, uh, the Pacifics, uh, we really are concerned this morning about the San Joaquin River and uh, I-5. Coalition goes from about Mendota on the south up towards Tracy on the north. We're testing uh, every month for pesticides, uh, water chemistry, and um, aquatic toxicity. Twice a year we do sample and test for sediment toxicity. Uh, we report the monitoring results every six months to the Regional Water Quality Control Board. And once a year, we provide a very exhaustive and extensive uh, written report. Um, more importantly, and why we're here today, is that we also develop, it, we develop management plans. The significance today is um, to inform you, we've been monitoring the subwatersheds for more than 10 years. And during that time, we've had several exceedances of water quality limits for pesticides and sediment toxicity. Uh, these have triggered management plans. And a management plan is a set of actions agreed upon by the regional board and the coalition to address water quality impairments. And this is a really a key why we're here today are these management plans. It's significant to note that the coalition uh, has 10 years or less from the time that a management plan was triggered to complete the management plan. Complete means that we have to solve the problem. This 10 year window is closing on many of the management plans and they have not been completed. The regional board is, is indicating that we are late. So the coalition with the help of growers, we have to get the MPs completed in a very short time. So the current water quality problems are such that uh, there, since 2008, there's been a very considerable drop off of pesticide detections and exceedances and surface water toxicity. This is a really good thing and we're really excited about that. But there are continued exceedances of water quality values for a few constituents and sediment toxicity. So the current water quality problem is that the 10 year deadline has run out and these management plans have to be completed. They have to be completed in months and not years. There's a process outlined by the regional board to complete this requirement. And if we can't complete it, there's gonna be consequences uh, from the regional water quality control board. So you're here today because the APNs that you farm are within 200 yards of a waterway and you applied a product that has been identified in these watersheds in the Los Banos Creek, Ramona Lake and Wesley Wasteway watersheds as having been used on your property. And these were done within the period of time between January 2017 and the fall of 2019. This map identifies the Wesley Wasteway watershed map it outlines the boundaries and associated and adjacent waterways. And more importantly, it shows the crop types that are growing within that subwatershed. This slide demonstrates the APNs that are associated uh, with this focused outreach. And that's why you're here today because you farm on those parcels. This slide here identifies the exceedances in the constituents uh, for the exceedances in your area. If you want more information, you can see table three in your packet. Uh, we'll give you much more information. And this last slide here shows the crop types of the Wesley Wasteway uh, that have been targeted for focused outreach with almonds and uh, grapes, apricots being the um, most prevalent. The coalition management plan strategy has four points, outreach and education, members to implement additional management practices when it's feasible, we're gonna to continue to monitor and access long-term changes in water quality. And improved water quality means the coalition can petition for the completion of the management plan and to reduce monitoring. So here's how we complete the management plans. We demonstrate that improved grower implement management practices have resolved the water quality problems. 
So this requires growers to evaluate their current farm management practices and implement new or additional practices to address the water quality impacts. And it requires a greater grower involvement in the management plan process. So water quality monitoring data demonstrates that there should be no exceedances of a particular constituent for at least three years. We'll then document completion education and outreach efforts to the applicable members when the where the exceedance has occurred. We'll document grower implemented management practices that address water quality problems. We'll demonstrate that implemented management practices are effective at addressing the water quality problems. And then we'll continue to track ongoing management practice implementation by growers through the farm evaluation process. There are consequences of not completing the management plans. If there's a determination by the executive office of the Regional Water Quality Control Board of inadequate progress, meaning time schedules are not met, it will trigger one or more of the following. A grower will have to develop and implement edge of field monitoring and create a study plan to characterize commodity specific discharges and determine new management practices that the grower has to implement. There could be on-site verification by the regional board of management practices and evaluation of adequacy. And it could go to the extreme that individual WDRs, waste discharge requirements would be required by the grower. It means revoking the coalition coverage for the individual parcels and require a report of waste discharge from the individual farmer. So here's what the order requires. Growers are required to implement water quality management practices as necessary to protect water quality described in the general order. Growers are required to implement effective sediment discharge and erosion prevention practices to minimize or to eliminate the discharge of sediment above background levels. Growers are to document plans to implement practices and later document that they have been implemented. So here's what growers can do. The best way to comply with current regulations is to implement management practices that eliminate irrigation discharges from fields. It's important to address stormwater discharges as well, and then complete the focused outreach survey with what you currently implement and mark any additional practices you intend to implement next year to protect water quality. That concludes my portion this morning. I'd like to introduce to you uh, my good friend, Perry Clausen from the group Cures, and he's gonna discuss management practices that can be implemented by growers. Thank you, Orbel, and I'm glad to be here today on this virtual presentation. Uh, again, Perry Claus, an executive director of Cures. Uh, Courtney Jello is helping out on putting together this presentation in these meetings. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard of Cures, we are a, a nonprofit that was formed over 17 years now uh, ago, and it was formed to help in educational programs on pest pesticides and crop nutrients. We were formed by commodity groups in the pesticide industry to work on efforts to try to minimize impacts of farm inputs on surface water and groundwater. So I'm here today to talk about some practices for you to consider in your farming operation to address these exceedances that Ortel's been discussing in the watersheds on the West Side Coalition. Cure's role is to assist with this focus outreach surveys and then on these focus outreach meetings. So the, the survey that, you, that has been sent to you in this packet includes these detailed description of the practices that you're now using on your farm. And there's also some suggested practices that'll be covered in this presentation that you could also see referred to in your survey. And then we are also helping and setting up these uh, outreach meetings in these targeted watersheds that, uh, that have the management plans in place. And then at some point, we'll be following up with growers who don't participate. And in this case, uh, watch this video to make sure that we are in compliance with the management plan requirements that the Water Board set forth. And we have a responsibility along with the West Side Coalition to make sure that 100% of the growers participate uh, in either watching, in both watching the video and completing the survey. So uh, there's no exempt exceptions for anyone there. Uh, it's, it's really, I think, a fairly easy uh, uh, requirement, but it does need to be completed for all the growers in these targeted watersheds. So we have been focusing on pesticides for many years, 
in the Central Valley and working on problems, field level, watershed level. And we come through to a conclusion through these efforts of, of finding that really there's only a few ways that pesticides make their way into surface water. In fact, we've reduced it down to three ways, pathways, if you will, that were pesticides are transported into surface water. The first is irrigation water. The second is storm water runoff and then spray drift. Uh, there may be other things mixed in loading spills that can transport into uh, irrigation runoff or storm rock runoff or even indirectly into waterways. And, and we think that happens occasionally. We have seen circumstances where exceedances are tracked back to improper mixing and loading, but it's not very common. Really, our focus and what our attention is in the west side, of it especially, is irrigation runoff and the spray drift management. And irrigation runoff can occur from uh, edge of field runoff from either sprinkler or furrow flood irrigation. And you know, the main point of, of managing these this kind of runoff is to minimize as much as you can that of runoff, or if possible, even eliminate that runoff because it transports sediment. And as Orville mentioned earlier, sediment uh, is a carrier of pesticides and can be detected in, in sediment sampling, but also in water column sampling. Now, in storm runoff, a, a lot more difficult to control. As we know, when you have a huge storm, there's not a lot you can do to control or, or trap that water but which you can consider doing if you know there's a rain event approaching is try to avoid any applications within as long a period as you can before a storm event. In other words, don't beat the storm by an hour uh, because as you, as you know, the, that reduces the effectiveness of the pesticide, but it can also lead to uh, transport of those pesticides off site. And if you can, if it's possible, uh, retain some of that water on site. Uh, these smaller storms uh, are that, uh, only a small amount of runoff. You can retain that on site by either putting up borders around the field uh, or just try to figure out a way to hold that first flush of water that comes off of a field. Because again, we, we've done studies and found that that first flush after your soil is saturated in the winter can be uh, a way that these pesticides are transported off site. And then we're gonna send, spend a little bit more time on spray drift here in a few minutes, but spray drift we're finding in some areas is the only way these products can make it to, to surface water. You know, the use of drip and micro sprinklers has eliminated uh, off, off site transport to a large extent, but. Uh, so it really leads to spray drift as the only transport method to, uh, pathway for these products to reach in, in, into water. And spray drift or overspray of waterways, uh, we can certainly detect them, these uh, overspray or this drift because we're measuring in parts per trillion. Requirements and standards for these pesticides are extremely low, and so we're able to detect these products uh, that have drifted into a waterway, even though they are minuscule amounts. And so the management practices that you can implement, and these are these are typically on the on label pesticide labels, is you have the appropriate setback and have a buffer between the sensitive area and the field. And then the other practical solution you can have when you have a field right up to a waterway is try to do those sprays at the edge of the fields when the wind's blowing away from the waterway. As we know on the west side, we have very changeable winds during the day where the morning it can be very calm, midday, late afternoon, you can get these winds coming out of the delta that can certainly blow into a waterway. So it's very important to think about these uh, when you're spraying these areas near the waterway, not the rest of your orchard, but those rows near the waterway to pay attention to that wind, the, the seasonality or the even daily changes of a wind pattern to try to plan that application when the wind is the lowest or is blowing away from that waterway. So another lesson that we've learned over the years is, and this started back in the 2000s where we were having a lot of diazonon problems. Well, growers, we, we think, uh, well, okay, you have a diazonon problem, I'm just gonna quit using diazonon, but I'm gonna switch to pyrethroids. 
Well, what we have learned is that if that field has irrigation or storm drainage or there's spray drip that's adjacent to the waterways, then there's a good chance we're gonna find the next product uh, that you switch to in that water. It's really not a product issue, it's a transport mechanism issue. So the, the, the bottom line you see, product substitution, it shifts the problem, it doesn't solve the problem. And unfortunately now with the change, uh, with, the, with the, uh, the banning or the discontinuation of chlorpyrifos, we are now finding the products that growers are using in replacement of these uh, old, old organophosphate products. And in particular, that includes the pyrethroids. So it's really a good thing to remember. It's not a product issue, it's a transport issue. And back on spray drift. So, you know, there has been studies done by the pesticide industry and others that have shown this spray drift has the potential, when, even in a light wind, to move a great distance downwind from the application site. What you see here in this chart is the various types of um, trees and their, the, uh, the stage and the time of the year. So dormant apples, and it could be the same for dormant almonds or peaches or anything, but when there's no leaves on the tree, and you have a light wind, there is a potential to have detection 300 feet away from the application site. That's a football field away. So again, back to the spray, uh, spray drift management and the direction of wind, it's very important to not have the wind blowing in the direction of, of a waterway. Now, as you see also, it's a little bit better when there's foliage on the tree, you know, there's a barrier and you can see a reduced amount, but there's still 50 feet away from the edge of a application site where you can, where it's possible to detect these pesticides. And again, at those very low levels that, that are being looked for. So here's some pesticide application uh, management practices. Uh, we do know too that uh, drift comes from the outside rows near sensitive areas. That's our concern. When you're in the middle of the field, when you're a mile away from the field, in the middle of nothing but orchards or fields, we're not concerned about the spray drift. But when you're on those outside rows, that is where the, the preponderance, the majority, maybe even all the drift comes from is those outside two rows. So again, watch that wind speed direction, you know, leave an attic with buffer zone. And then when you have a ground rig, not an orchard air blast, but a ground rig, if you use larger droplet nozzles, those nozzles creates larger droplets and those droplets have less tendency to drip. Uh, some of these uh, some of these sprayers that have very small droplets and at, uh, almost in an atomizer, they have almost a fog light app fog-like application that has the, the uh, characteristic of, a, of drifting a very great distance. So try to use a larger droplets when possible on your spray applicator. So some of the other uh, BMPs uh, management practices you can use specific to row crop sprayers is try not to use too high of a nozzle pressure for the same reason as we talk about droplet size. When you crank up that nozzle, pressure, the, the higher the, the pressure, the more fines are created by that uh, high pressure. So the, the lower the pressure that you can still get good coverage, it can minimize the amount of drift coming off that ground ring. The other thing is if you're driving too fast, that application speed can create little mini vortexes behind the applicator. Uh, typically we don't go that fast, but there are instances where growers are trying to get across fields quickly and you can create excessive drip by driving too fast. And then uh, making sure those nozzles are always turned off uh, when it's near or directly over a drainage ditch. That may seem like a no-brainer, but there's sometimes a situation where we get in a hurry and we say, well, it's only a drain ditch, you know, it's not going to matter. But boy, when that water gets in that ditch, solubilizes those pesticides, we're going to find that in the surface water. So talk about air blast sprayers for a minute. So when, when you are spraying in these rows adjacent to a waterway, again, always make sure that wind is blowing away from the, the waterway. And then also turn on the nozzles only after entering the field. That tree uh, uh, enables you to have a little bit of a barrier to stop that drift. And then turn off the nozzles at the end of a row and at the edge of the field. 
especially those outward facing nozzles. If you're coming around that outside row, make sure those outer nozzles are off because that can create tremendous spray drifts off the edge of a, a field. So, in, and I mentioned earlier about mixing and loading not being a very common way for these products to get into the waterway, but if, if you do have a slope and you do have water that could uh, hit where you're doing mixing and loading, try to do that mixing and loading on the top end or the uppermost gradient of a field, farthest away from the waterways. And then spray that tank rinse aid back on the field, don't drain it in the waterways. Uh, unfortunately, again, we have found instances where it's been detected or we found these products in water because somebody decided that that drain was a good place to put the rinse aid. The other thing I've checked with a number of PCAs and registrants also about reapplying that rinse aid. You're not gonna, you don't have to be concerned about washing the tr treatment off the plant especially if you wait a little bit for that spray to dry from the actual application, that amount of water is really not gonna rinse that spray uh, off that plant. Cause it's not, especially if you do the main, maintain that good speed through the field, you're not, gonna, you're not gonna rinse your application off. And then if possible, of course you gotta, you gotta watch what you're uh, uh, mixing with, but use that rinse aid in your next batch. If it's a fungicide and you're doing an insecticide, uh, it, it, it's not going to uh, it's not going to affect the uh, the application material that you're applying. Of course, you don't want to mix uh, products that are not compatible. And usually, a label will give you warnings on which products are incompatible and should not be followed be, uh, behind uh, an application, unless you use a very thorough tank rinse. So, I want to talk a minute too about a new spray technique that uh, Cures has been studying along with some support from the University of California and Department of Food and Agriculture. It's a very simple approach uh, that relies, it takes two sprayers. Uh, this is one of the, the difficult parts, but many growers these days have two sprayers or have a neighbor they can borrow. But the idea is that sprayer is you're doing your two rows, uh, your outside row in this row two as you typically would. And then that outside sprayer B is spraying inward uh, we tried experiments both with the material coming out of the sprayer and then with air only. And we found that when you just spray air only, you can blow your spray drift back in the field and still get adequate coverage in that first row from sprayer A. So we're calling this technique interference perimeter spraying. And again, the idea, we're, we're trying to study it more to find out if we're getting efficacy of the pest uh, when we use this technique. So far, the data has been, it has been very promising. What we have not done is in uh, done this test in high winds, high winds being under 10, which is the label limit. Typically, we haven't tested seven, eight miles an hour. And then we also want to further evaluate the spray coverage, especially in taller trees like walnuts, and then also use different types of sprayers. So far, we've focused on using uh, the Aerofan sprayers and Durand Wayland sprayers. It seems to work pretty good on the PTO sprayers, but we're still evaluating whether or not the engine-driven sprayers can benefit from this technique. So Curious has available a, a, um, a brochure that we developed on our website. You see the address there in the middle of the page. It's both in English and Spanish. Uh, you can request that. If we had a real live meeting, we would have it sitting on the table, but you can request copies of this, or you can go to the website and print it out. We've also created a short video that explains the practice, shows some of the work that we did uh, out in the field as we were evaluating this, pra uh, this practice in uh, actually in Orchards and the West Side Coalition in Almonds and Walnuts. So I encourage you to take a look at this and consider this. Uh, we think that we, you know, orchard sprayers are really tough to manage spray drift, um, even with the practices we recommend. Uh, earlier, but this this may be a technique if you can find another sprayer that can run parallel that can help minimize that off-site movement. So what is the best management pr practice? You know, best is, a, is kind of a scary word to use because best applies to an individual farm. What's best for you may not be best for me, but we want to just look at these three general approaches when we talk about this storm drainage, especially and irrigation drainage. 
So there's three things that you can consider. You can manage the pesticide applications prior to the drainage periods. And as I mentioned before, the storm events, try to be before the train of, um, before the storm events as much as you can before you do the application. Same with if you have irrigation drainage that enters the waterway, try to make that application as far away from that drainage period as you can. These products will degrade out in the field over a period of days but it's not, you can't depend on it to be uh, completely degraded by the time you irrigate. The other practice is you manage the runoff. You know, either you can contain that, uh, that runoff in a uh, pond or you can recirculate it. I'll talk a bit more of that. And then the treat the drainage or the runoff. Not many products, not many techniques we can use it that uh, show effectiveness in treating the drainage. It's an extra step, but it is an option with certain fields and, and practices. Now in the West Side region, there's been a lot of effort by the irrigation districts to construct, construct these regional recirculation systems. I mean, these are the ideal. If you have to drain, if you can't control it, just try to figure out a way to move that water into a, into a drainage facility that then recirculates and reuses that water. Uh, we're talking about here, as you see on the map on the left, the, the Marshall Road drain has a, uh, there was a, a reservoir constructed that's capturing that water that's very, uh, very beneficial and useful for water, conser conserving water, but also for allowing these pesticides to, uh, to diminish and break down in the water. This particular uh, uh, drainage facility has about 60 acre feet of storage. It settles out. You see the numbers there, 2,000 cubic yards of sediment every year. That's approximately 5 million pounds. That's a lot of sediment. And then we, it recirculates this drainage water back into an irrigation system where it can be used and applied to a field. So the other way, uh, the other approach you see on many ranches now is this use of uh, on-farm recirculation system. Uh, there's fewer and fewer of these uh, out out and about now because of the use of drip, but there are still uh, systems out there. They work very well. Uh, you know, what you do, you collect that water, you, you have a small pump that then recirculates the water back on the top of the field and, and reuse in the field. And the value of this is it allows sediment to settle out and then of course makes that water useful for irrigation purposes on the farm. And then the tailwater recirculation systems, there's various ways that these systems are set up. You can see in the left background, that is a long ditch that serves as a pond. And then that water is pumped and mixed with fresh water, blended with water to help improve that water quality. In this particular farm, they have a high EC, a lot of salt, so they need to blend with fresh water to, to improve that water quality that's applied to the crop. And then this is just another shot of a small sediment pond on farm where it collects the drainage from the, the fields that you see in the background. It allows that sediment to settle out. Here it's, it's a period after the drainage has stopped. So you can start to see the sediment accumulating in the bottom of the pond. And then on the left and the right, that is sediment that has been removed from that pond over time. So it's a considerable amount of, of soil that moves off these fields. Uh, this isn't an extreme uh, situation. And it, it's not an unmanageable situation. This grower will take that soil, spread it on roads, build up his berms a little bit, but it is, it's, it's to the point where it's not really too difficult to manage that excess sediment that uh, accumulates in that pond. And then I mentioned the, the, the treatment. So there really is only one product out there that, sh that is shown uh, to be effective on the sediment bound pesticides. Water soluble pesticides, it doesn't work so well. But when you have a pyrethroid and some of the other products that bind to sediment, when you apply a PAM to the field, it acts as a flocculant and, and causes that sediment to settle. And the, the differences are dramatic, uh, not to be uh, dramatic in the statement, but you see on the before and after, when you have it properly applied, it can help uh, drop out a tremendous amount of sediment in the field. And this uh, prevents that sediment from leaving the field and also uh, prevents these pesticides from leaving the field as well. So one of the other practices that's been looked at, there's not a lot of use of it, but it has shown to be effective and that's having vegetation in a ditch, in your drainage ditch. 
This uh, particular photo you see here, we set up a ve vegetated ditch at the end of an alfalfa field. And what we found is it, it did uh, filter out even the water soluble pesticides. And it doesn't need to be at the end of an alfalfa field like you see here. Even your drainage ditches that you might have on farm allow some of that vegetation to grow. You don't want it to get out of control, obviously, and, and become a problem. But any amount of vegetation in that ditch can act as a natural filter for the sediment that's in the water and even from some of the waterborne or water uh, soluble pesticides that, that could move off site. So our goal with the, this pesticide stewardship and completing these management plans is we've got to be proactive. This uh, problem of pesticides in waterways is one of the, uh, you know, the straw that broke the camel's back, if you will, for chlorpyrifos. There were other issues related to that product's loss, but one of the problems was uh, the, the number of exceedances that we've seen around the Central Valley and Central Coast. And frankly, we're running out of pesticide classes right now. We see a lot of use of pyrethroids that replace the OPs, but if pyrethroids become restricted, we're just losing our broad spectrum chemistry. And we need to, to figure out a way to preserve those. And again, back to switching products. If we switch away from pyrethroids to something else, still have those transport mechanisms in place, we're gonna cause that problem to occur with other chemistry. And sad to say, the next class of pesticides, insecticides that we're seeing is the neonicotinoids, which is a very uh, effective uh, aphid product, controls aphids and other sucking insects. And we're starting to see that in waterways because of the issues that I described before. It replaces some of these other products and the transport mechanisms are still in place. So we really don't want to transfer these problems to another class of chemistry if we can. And we're always looking for new ideas of how to manage this drainage better. If you have ideas, you know, just scratch them down on your survey, you know, call Orville, myself. We're always looking for other approaches to try to control and mitigate these problems. They are not unique to the West Side. We have the valley-wide, statewide, wherever we have irrigated agriculture. So, you know, I'm a farmer myself, we know how to solve problems. We want to tap into the intelligence and experience of, of every grower to see if there are ways we can pre preserve these valuable tools for managing pests on our crops. So here's our contact information. You see on the top, the Water Coalition, Joe McGann and Orville's contact information, West Side Coalition. You see my email there and our Cures Works website. We have a number of these publications beyond what I was talking about on this, on this uh, presentation and also some other videos available on management practices. So I appreciate your patience today and watching this and uh, West, uh, wish the best of luck to you and your crops and your farms this year. Thanks a lot. One more thing, we want you to, to be sure to fill out this survey that was included in your packet. And uh, on page eight and 10 of your packet and mail them to address you see on the screen, uh, or you can email a copy of your survey to the email address you see here. Obviously you're watching this on a video. You can freeze your frame right now, copy this down. You can also call Orville, myself, Courtney, anyone, and we can figure out a way to get your survey turned in. But as we mentioned earlier, we have a responsibility for 100% response on this program. Thanks again.